Hi, this is Steve Lee Andrews, Outlaw Bookseller, and I thought I'd give you a different perspective on the hideout this morning. Um, we're in a corner that you don't normally see, and as you can see, the reason you don't see it, and the reason you don't see my lovely collection of science fiction sort of octavos um, behind me there, is because the entire area is full of really useful boxes, full of all sorts of cultural artifacts and Blu-rays, DVDs, um, comics, graphic novels, what have you, books, and so on and so on. But I thought I'd really fancy to sit down, to be honest, in a comfy chair. So do forgive my um, my um, sort of laziness and please indulge me. And we're going to talk a little bit about um, what I've been reading in the last month or so. No sooner does one return from Heian Wai and a selling trip, and of course I'm buying, the one thinks, well, maybe it's time to get rid of a bit more. So I'm sort of looking at some of the shelves now. And this is mostly kind of this front row is mostly stuff I want to reread or I haven't read yet. Um, there's some recently acquired stuff here, like for example, those Michael Curlins, which I'll talk about soon. That Paul de Filippo I got a while ago. A um, couple of good crime novels just been reissued. Ted Lewis's Billy Rags. We'll read that soon. And um, Donald E. Westlake's Call Me a Cab, which I'm really excited about. I've never read that before. It's been available for a very long time. So there's things like that. And, you know, one looks at um, there's other things like these anthologies, for example, which I've got anywhere else to put them at the moment. And, um, you know, Christopher Frey, I'll talk about that at some point. So I'm kind of looking through and trying to sort of pick out some things which I'm going to maybe eBay because it might be a while before I go to Hay again and the things I can possibly sell. Um, I don't think it's going to be any of these at the front here. It's probably not going to be anything here either, though I am thinking about that Adrian Tchaikovsky Bearhead, which was okay, but I didn't enjoy as much as Dogs of War. So um, it's a lot of limited editions down here and sort of old things, a lot of which will stay in the collection, but I am starting to think of what will I actually read again. You get to a certain time in your life and you realise you're not going to read it all again, and yet at the same time there are core things you want to keep in the collection. This is a flyer I found in a paperback I bought in Hay for the old American SF book club. I think this dates to the sort of late 70s, early 80s. I think it's late 70s because Star Wars is mentioned on there. And um, I'll, I'll sort of look at this in a video at one point. But, you know, any four books for 10 cents, fantastic. Oops. Look at these, hardback anthologies, a real treat. And a lot of these are signed by um, contributors. This is something I used to do when I was collecting over the years is you'd have these and of course, you know, you'd meet some of these people and get them to sign them. So some of them are sort of signed inside. Um, but you know they're, they're beautiful stuff you know they're signed by people like M. John Harris and Christopher Priest people I sort of know and met you know either know or met several times um, so yeah so I think I've got to relocate these I can also show some of these in detail at, um, on later Christopher Priest videos because a lot of these feature things by him and M. John right so they're now there with those other couple of anthologies and um, I'm really pleased to have got that. I got that on um, AB or eBay. I can't remember which, for about six quid. I love Brandon Bailey, and this is one of the sort of more scarce ones. And it's got a little bit of a spine ripple, but it's a great neck. And that's, I think I've only got one left now to get, which I think is Star Virus, the first one. Um, and I also bought this um, really nice copy of Avron Davidson's Clash of Star Kings. It's Scott Bradfield who talked about Avron Davidson, and um, who I've not read enough of. And um, he raved about this one. And um, look at that, super lurid. 
So as you will have seen, I went on a book buying trip to Hay on Wye recently and sold a lot of stuff there and um, used the money to sort of acquire some some other things. And you'd have seen the um, the Hay on Wye book haul. There is another one from late last year. If um, you haven't seen that, do look at the backlist on the channel. It's something I always notice, and I know I've said this before, but people will subscribe to a channel but not look at the backlist and ask questions and make post comments, which is fine. Um, but um, often the answers are there in the backlist. So do have a look. Women in science fiction. Um, you know, we hear the narrative again and again and again that, you know, women have always been excluded from science fiction. What utter and absolute rot. Women have always been welcome in science fiction. Yes, admittedly, in the early days of genre science fiction, there were very few of them. However, they were there. If you go back to the 1930s, you've got wonderful writers like C.L. Moore, Catherine Lucille Moore and Lee Brackett. Later on, you had people like Catherine McLean and Judith Merrill, who I talked about. So they were there in small numbers, but they were there. And of course, once you get to the 1960s and you get people like Ursula Le Guin, Joanna Ress, then, you know, really that debate was over by, you know, by the early 70s. So at the moment, there's an awful lot of talk about inclusivity, diversity, what have you, in all sorts of areas of life. And you know, that's, a, that's a good thing. Um, and Brian Aldiss once famously said that science fiction couldn't claim to be a material literature until as many women as men read it. And I think that's where the issue comes in. I think it's not so much that there haven't been women working in science fiction, because they have, and there's been some very, very fine ones indeed, but have women engaged with science fiction as much as they could have, could have. So I'm going to knock the ball back into your park if you're a woman. And if you haven't read science fiction, then, you know, you can't blame anybody else for not sort of, you know, so influencing your choice. It's never been a boys club. There's always been a few people who like to exclude people. Most of us in the world of science fiction would always wish there were more ladies involved. So, and if the word lady is offensive, I apologize. I'm of that generation and I don't see it as a bad thing. But so recently I've been um, looking at um, some science fiction um, by women because um, I have sort of um, haven't read much contemporary SF for the last sort of year or so. So I decided to read some things which had um, popped up and looked interesting. And one of them was The Swimmers by Marion Womack, which came out last year, and it looks like this. Now, Marion Walmack is of Spanish descent, but she, uh, I think she grew up and was educated in the UK. And um, she's sort of been shortlisted for some awards and what have you. And The Swimmers is a, somebody on Amazon described it as a eco-gothic dystopia. Um, I didn't actually find it very gothic myself at all. The word I would use about it, and you saw how beautiful the cover was, is limpid. It's very slow moving. Some would say stately. I would say, quite frankly, slow. I think it lacks muscle. I don't think it's very well articulated. Um, I think the info dump is overly subtle and not that effective. It's sort of set in um, in a future world where you know there's been ecolo ecological catastrophe, and it's set in Andalusia in Spain. You wouldn't know that, and it makes great claims to being you know a novel which has this richly invented world of mutating animals and plants and quite frankly you compare it to something like Hot House by Brian Aldiss or maybe something like even like The Ultimate Jungle by Michael Coney and it's really really quite weak um, and I have to say it's a really dull book. It's very worthy, it has the feel of late Lagan. Um, if I were to recommend a similar but far better book I would go with The Door Into Ocean by Joan Slonjewski. I'm not sure if I'm pro pronouncing that right but it's a very difficult name and it looks like this. Joan's a biologist and you know it's a far more muscular book um, again the influence of Lagan is obviously of it it came out I think back in the 80s um, and um, you know that's really good so seek it out and still get it it's a really handsome trade paperback out there and it was in women's press SF but I would say read that instead of the swimmers which I thought was very very tame and average by comparison at the moment, um, in work, um, as I read in work, I have a book in work and a book at home, um, I'm reading The Animals in That Country by Laura Jean Mackay, which looks like this. Now, this is a book which won the Arthur C. Clarke Award last year. When you look at it, you can tell it's published as a mainstream novel. The only indication that it's SF is that it has the, um, the sort of signal that it's won the Arthur C. Clarke Award on the cover. And the description on the back tells of a 
plague in Australia, and it's sort of pre, it was written pre-pandemic apparently, um, which basically gets people into a strange state of mind. They they catch this flu type um, um, malady, and they can start to understand what animals are saying and, and animals' languages, and they can sort of communicate with animals. It's quite interesting. I'm only about fifty pages in, but it's very really strongly written. It's muscular. The prose is very sort of definite and sinewy um, and it's written from the point of view of a middle-aged woman who works in a wildlife park where they take in rescued animals there's all sorts of wallabies and dingoes and what have you there and um, it's a realist it's a very realist novel it's obviously set in the very very near future or you know five minutes from now and I'm thoroughly enjoying it at the moment I'll give you a full report on that when I finish it but the animals in that country Laura Jean Mackay so as I've been reading some contemporary SF by women, I decided to read something from um, the great days of women's press SF back in the 80s. Um, I've mentioned them before, they did books in a grey livery, which as I think I've said, I think were mostly bought by men. And um, they featured, women's press only published female authors, they published people like Joanna Russ. And they did lots of fiction and non-fiction. They did an SF line. And one of the authors in their SF line was um, this writer, Suzette Hayden Elgin. And this is Communipath Worlds, which is an omnibus of her first three novels. And I bought this um, in Hay, and you've seen it in my last video. And I've read it over the last few days. And Suzette Hayden Elgin, as I think I mentioned there, was a linguist, um, professor, what have you and she started writing these and initially they were an ace and then door and I've now read the first four of these and they span the early 70s I think the last one which I don't have which is the fifth novel um, came out in the late 80s and I'm very interested to read that because by the late 80s you're into cyberpunk and things have changed quite a lot in American SF so I read this and Community Path Worlds the basic idea is that um, you have a Lagan Hainish Galactic Federation Asimov type thing and basically the way that people communicate across the vast distances of space they've got spaceships which are obviously pretty fleet they go into sort of suspension they're there and they're the other side of the galaxy and there's actually three galaxies in a few days or what have you um, but the way they communicate instantaneously is not through something like the Ansible in Lagan, which uses um, quantum entanglement. They ha and they use people who are telepaths and they have something called the bucket. Just like the idea of you have in, you know, when you have a fire and before you had fire brigades, the only thing you could do is have a line of people and you pass buckets back and forth and throw water over them. And the bucket um, is sort of made up of a string of telepaths who are on different planets and they convey messages to each other and it goes pretty much instantaneously from one galaxy to another one to the third because it's the tri-galactic federation which is three galaxies and these center around a character called Co Coyote Jones who is a, um, a special kind of telepath and I won't go too much into him I just want to show you the cover again now, I showed this last time and this actually does depict a scene from one of the books, from the third book in the series. The first book is called The Community Paths. The second is called Furthest. And the third in this omnibus volume is called At the Seventh Level. And they're not brilliant, but they are interesting. They're very short, just over 100 pages. So they're really about how religion shapes different planets and different sort of ways of looking at things. And um, they are they are interesting. They get better as they go on. The third one at the seventh level is about a society which is based upon um, a religion where poetry is a vocation, and women are terribly suppressed in it. And it's not done in a really heavy-handed Margaret Atwood type. It's done in quite a subtle way. It doesn't pull any punches. Um, and there's obviously a feminist slant to it, but it's not a beat you over the head with a stick thing. You know, it, it's it's subtler than that. And it's possible that Elgin may only have been able to get those get that in by being subtle because her editor was Don Wolheim. Um, and later on, she wrote um, a book called Native Tongue, another book called Judas Rose, which was a sequel. And those are the ones which were in women's press. And the idea of those um, was that women were sort of dangerous and that they become oppressed through American law and what have you. But these are sort of subtler. <clears throat> and I think in that way, they're sort of probably more effective. And I, I enjoyed these. They have a certain lack of strength um, when it comes to the big reveal, because there's a kind of mystery in each one that needs to be solved. There's a pseudo crime plot thing in them. And they've got great ideas. They're very witty at times. 
Um, they do seem quite archaic, even for their period. Um, if you compare them to a lot of the sort of post wave, new wave things, where you had hard SF meshed with new wave, which you've got in people like, say, um, Gregory Benford, um, Joe Haldeman, those sort of people, then they do seem quite sort of, um, I don't know, there's, there's a slightly archaic feeling about them. They must have been that even at that time. But, you know, she uses the, the well to get across the idea, anthropological ideas and ideas about language and what have you. So very interesting. And the fourth one, um, Star Anchored, Star Angered. What a great title. And that's Door there as well. And I enjoyed all of these, though I was slightly disappointed in each case by the denouement because it seemed slightly vaguer than it should have been. And... Um, you know, I would. Am I going to read the fifth one? I don't know. If I see it, I'll pick it up because I'd be interested to see how she coped with the changing landscape of SF post Gibson and what a fifth one would be like and whether she'd incorporated any of the more up to date ideas about technology which came out in Cyberpunk, which proved to be, you know, the, the way the world was going to be. So that's Suzette Hayden Elgin, um, but I enjoyed those. They were great fun. So, moving on. <clears throat> At the moment, I'm reading this book, Clash of Star Kings, um, by Avram Davidson, which was recommended by Scott Bradfield. Hey, Scott, on his channel. And if you don't know Scott's channel, do check it out. It's really great. Um, Scott's a writer, creative writing teacher, all round good guy and um, great, um, great online friend of mine. And he recommended this as I've never read much Davidson and I'm only about 30 pages into it. And apparently this wasn't the original title. This was pushed onto it by the publishers. And this is an ace reissue from the early 80s. And it's set in Mexico around an Aztec village and uh, around sort of alien intervention um, back in the days of the Aztecs and it sort of all, all comes back around again. So I guess it's a bit like Q the Winged Serpent, I guess. Um, and the writing's really, really good. Um, you know, there's a real maturity there. And you can imagine, you know, somebody like Graham Greene or D.H. Lawrence or, dare I say it, Malcolm Lowry. You know, you immediately think of Mexico, you think of these people. But it's really, really well written, you know, and it, it belies its um, rather silly sort of cover and title and the the blurb on the back that says they came from the evil stars so i'm enjoying this it's really strong muscular prose it just flows so easily it's conversational and there's an effortless quality to the writing which is which is really quite something so thanks for that scott i am enjoying this and i'll do a fuller review when i finish it so that's something i'm reading at home at the moment i've been reading other things besides sf of course and as everybody who watches the channel knows, I've read a lot of non-fiction recently, a lot about hauntology, psychogeography, travel, what have you. And I've kind of moved off that, that a bit now, even though I have a few more things to read in that area, which I have piled up. And um, now and again, I've started reading classic children's books. Not something I do, because I think at the moment, quite frankly, there are way too many adults reading kids' books and YA. And, you know, they need to step up and move on. But I'm reading or rereading some classic ones. And something which I've been meaning to read for a long time, because I read it as a child, I had a really nice hardback, and I don't know what happened to it, is um, Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island. And look at this. This is a lovely vintage children's classic with a cover by Tim McDonough, which I think is a fantastic bit of illustration. And this has been around for some years, and I've been meaning to buy it simply because the cover is so great. And I have very vivid memories of the opening sequences in Cornwall and Bristol. And I have to say, they are superb. And Stevenson, of course, wrote one of the great science fiction novels, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And I thoroughly enjoyed this. And it, he doesn't pull punches on the language, you know, nothing, you know, it doesn't explain, he throws in the nautical terms. And I've read lots of the great maritime novels from people like um, Melville, London, Conrad, you know, all those sort of people. And I really love them. And um, it's this is great, you know, and the characters are so strong and they're nuanced and it's got sort of iconic things in it like the black spot blind poo captain flint the parrot you know everything we think of with pirates pretty much comes from this book whether it's right or not and it really is a fantastic read and again i can only use the word muscular the writing is really clear and strong and colorful and the characterization is just absolutely marvelous so this is the sort of thing I want from a children's book. And is it a children's book? It's got a young guy called Jim Hawkins as a character. But, you know, I guess children read it at the time. They would have, and I'm sure adults would have as well. But it's a great book all round. So it's really nice to reread that. And I have got some more. Um, I think maybe later in the year I'll do something about some classic children's books, which I've been reading. Because, um, you know, just now and again, they are, they mostly children's fantasy and science fiction I'm reading. But um, it, it is quite refreshing as a palate cleanser. So, aside from 
the Hay and White trip, something I, something I bought online recently, and I just wanted to show it to you because it's quite beautiful and it ties into another thread I'm going to be doing soon, is um, I got this Sidrick and Jackson, um, I think late 70s, early 80s copy of the best of Arthur C. Clarke, 1956 to 1972. I'm going to show you that. Absolutely beautiful. Look at that blue, orange, yellow. And it's published by Sidgwick and Jackson. Um, and it's a little, um, very small octavo hardcover. And I got this on AB from a bookseller in Cardiff. And this was 18 pounds. Now you think, well, that's quite expensive, you know, because you buy a new hardcover and cost you 18 pounds. Not always. Um, 18, 99, 10 would be the price for Royals. Demis will come in as little as 12 99 usually about 16 99 So I got this because um, I do like Sidgwick's Best Of series. And Sidgwick was sort of a publisher who, they were at the lower end of the scale of SF publishing. They published names, um, but they weren't up there, say, with Golanx or Harper Collins. It still exists as an imprint. It's part of um, the Pan Macmillan Group. Um, and I just wanted to show you this at 18 pounds because if you go in AB, you'll see there's one dealer who's got a set of the two, and I haven't got the first one. I'm more interested in Clark's later material because I've read most of the earlier stuff, and this is 56, when his style picks up a bit, because he is quite clunky. He's not a great pro stylist. He's more of an ideas man. And um, I say there's a dealer on AB who's asking something like 240 quid for the pair, and the conditioner is not as nice as this, because this was new old stock. It was effectively new book. And it just goes to show you know, you don't have to pay silly money. You know, sometimes you might have to, but 245 for two, I, I can't really see that. Um, but 18 pounds, I was really pleased with that. So I'm gonna keep it out for the first one. If I ever see it, I'll pick it up. If I don't see it, I won't be paying 245 pounds or even half of that for it, if you see what I mean. So very pleased with that. And that's really beautiful. And those beautiful books I've acquired recently. I do like a certain vintage charm, as you know. Something else I also bought, because of course I, I get a discount in my work as a bookseller, and this came in one day, I was unpacking books at the back door, and I, on impulse I decided to get it. This is John Scalzi, um, who's been reasonably popular the last 20 years. He broke through sort of towards the end of the 20th, 20th century, a book called Old Man's War, um, which was sort of posited as a Heinlein type thing. And this is the Keiju Preservation Society. And you probably can't see, this is what you call a demi hardcover. So it's not a royal, it's not a big one, it's a smaller one. And this was 1699, it's published by Tor. Um, and Scarzi is somebody who I'll admit I've not read. I've never really fancied the looks of his books. And basically this is about a guy who goes to work for um, an animal rights um, organization, but it's actually animals from another dimension. The cage, which of course, as you probably know, means giant creatures from um, beyond Godzilla, whatever his Japanese term. And I'm not really that sort of turned on by that kind of thing. You know, as a kid, I love monster movies. Um, I think I've got Mothra somewhere. I've got the original Godzilla. I, a very sort of weak spot for the Matthew Broderick remake, which um, is one of my popcorn movies. And the more recent one, I think, is really good as well. The sequels are dreadfully dull. But the first one, when it's all, almost all in the dark, is really good. So I, on a whim, I decided to go for this. I'm going to read it this month, and I'll get back to you and let you know. Um, a friend of mine called Andy Davidson, um, who writes books about Doctor Who and the Tomorrow People. If you're a fan of the Tomorrow People, he wrote a book called Jaunt and there's a new edition coming out. And he's a great guy, Andy. We haven't seen each other for a few years. We used to go drinking a lot together in London. Lovely, lovely guy. And um, he used to run a um, Carry On Films website. If he still does, I must check. So I know he's read it and he said it's fantastic. And he's 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 a well-read chap, you know, he likes good stuff. So I'm gonna give that a go and I'll let you know. And it's had some, you know, good, good reviews and stuff from the right sort of people. So something I'm gonna be doing soon is I'm gonna do a little series about some of the sort of publishers who no longer do SF anymore in Britain, who used to in the 70s and 80s, which is my preferred period of nostalgia, as you know, and talk about their, their, their sort of output. And that'll run sort of alongside the 100 Must Read Science Fiction Novel series, which starts, or has started by now, which I hope you're enjoying. And I'm going to try and expand that a bit. I'm doing readings from, from the book 100 Must Read Science Fiction Novels and talk a bit more broadly about the author beyond the readings. But I'm going to do this thing about publishers, and I think I'm going to do something soon on what I call the Sidgwick Silvers. Again, Sidgwick and Jackson, who produced the Arthur C. Clarke book. Late 70s, early 80s, um, they did about 10 of these books in silver liveries. 
and some of them are by authors who never publish very much some of them like this one charles sheffield went on had a reasonably good career hard sf author um i think this is his first book and there's about 10 of them and there's some i haven't read so i'm going to kind of present them as a series and i'll talk you through them because you know sometimes it's good to turn over rocks because these are the sort of books you find for five quid when you go in a second hand bookshop in the uk they're dotted around they're not difficult to get one or two of them are hard to get in others luckily i've got those so and i think there's 10 of them all together so i'm going to do the sidgwick silvers view at one point let you know what they're like another one of the sort of publishers i want to look at whose output was smaller and who were no longer around are elmfield press who did some very attractive books and this is one of their more common ones this is the book of philip jose farmer which i've had a paperback of for years and um you know you see this around a lot as well or you used to and elmfield they um they were only around for a few years they did some nice books there's some very obscure books authors only had one book published so we're going to look at some of the sort of forgotten gems of publishing we'll also look more small presses so that's the sort of look at what has been occupying my mind the last few weeks with books and um, to everybody who subscribed recently thank you very much there is something coming up i'm thinking about dystopian novels a lot because i've done some sort of top fives and what have you and i haven't done them for a while and they've been very popular so i am thinking of doing a top five dystopian novels and i get asked all the time when we work for dystopias and, and i kind of despair about it because you obviously go for you know the great big things which are of course 1984 my favorite novel of all time brave new world um there are lots of others but it's a question which often stumps me because once you've done those you've done samyata and what have you the background condition of about 80 or 90 percent of sf that's published is dystopian so you know you know most of philip k dick's novels have dystopian backgrounds you know it's it's one of those things so if you read sf you automatically read dystopias you know and um the way the term is used these days there was a time when the only people who used the word dystopia were science fiction fans and science fiction critics and readers and now it's thrown about as if it's something separate but it's not dystopia is the fundamental background condition of most sf i mean one of my favorite science fiction novels in the 70s triton aka trouble on triton by samuel r delaney is theoretically um a utopian novel you know and you get things like isla Lagan's the dispossessed which sort of looks at two different utopias are they utopias or not are they dystopias depends on the point of view um so i'm going to try and pick up my favorite dystopian novels which are less famous for now i would sort of really focus on the one i would sell if it was in print and if i could get hold of it and i would sell it again and again because i think it's a magnificent novel is keith roberts's molly zero but we'll talk about that again so this is outlaw bookseller hope you're enjoying your reading um questions or comments below as usual thanks for subscribing and i'll see you again soon bye for now